spirit world. Um, right. I understood emotions very well in the spirit world all the time and even in the first century on earth. And I understood the connection with God, of course, very well. And I understood all of the intricacies and the laws of God very well. But I didn't understand how to help a person the best possible way to help a person from a condition of sin to get into this state of a one with God. And that was a part of my choice this time around, was to go through that experience. Now, for Mary, Mary understood better than I did. Because Mary, in the first century, went through that like I'm going through it now. So she actually understood people uh, better than I did in a lot of ways because of that. Yeah. I understand that. Pity we didn't get it the first time round. Pity, all yeah. I can say. Yeah, it is a pity. Yeah. Uh, there's, there was not much I could do about that <laughs> in three and a half years. <laughs> um, obviously, um, what could have happened in the first century if I hadn't have passed is that Mary would have gotten to a one minute condition with God over a period of time as well and she would have had all this knowledge about how to do it from a condition of sin or error in the first century which she could have then been able to teach but unfortunately the world wasn't in the state of readiness really for a lot of that and particularly wasn't in a state of readiness to be taught by a woman and so you know and the events that happened to myself obviously finished up precluding uh, that from occurring mm. all right we'll just just a quick one on the on the emotional thing, all right. Um, I was listening to some of the things you were saying, especially about fear of death. All right. I'm not, I'm not, I don't think I've got fear of death. Fear of how I'm going to die, that's another so one. Fear of pain, more yes, than the, the death. Yes, the pain, whether yep. it's, you know, going to be dragged out or whatever, you know, yeah. or... If, well, that's true. Yeah. Well, most, or or, most or of I could be driving that. under a bridge and it goes clump, you yeah. know, like, who knows. So that's it, the death isn't an issue at all, yeah. you know. But it's the way you die that's the yeah, issue. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. That wasn't the question. That wasn't the question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah um, the other one is the Bible. All right. As a child, I was never read up as any type of, like, in Christianity or mm -hmm. Catholic, whatever. Mm -hmm. All right. So I've never ever been interested in the Bible. Yep. Ever. All right. Um, and then as I got older, I never wanted to read the Bible because of the difference in uh, uh, you know, Catholic Church of England, different religions. Yeah. All right, so I never knew what was right, what was wrong, so I never bothered to read it because it didn't interest me. Okay, yeah. I didn't know, you know, they contradict each other. Yeah. All right. So if I wanted to read the Bible, I well, thank God it's been because... You've come along that's straightened things out. Yeah. <laughs> well, I haven't straightened things out yet, but I... Well, you, well, <laughs> well as in, no, I mean, as in confirming what is right in the Bible, yep. how do we know what's wrong in the Bible? <laughs> so the question is, how do we know what's wrong in the Bible? That's so why I'm reading it and I'm going, well, what's true and what's not? Okay. You know, except for you confirming what's true and what's not. Okay, the only real way of knowing what's true with anything, let alone what's in the Bible, is for you to be completely feeling your emotions without any error and you being at one with God while you do that. And then what will happen is God will confirm everything to you that's in error and God will confirm everything to you that's in truth through that connection. Now, so then the question becomes, well, I'm not there, so how do I do it in this place where I'm well, not more there? more of the emotional blockages I have that stop the feeling of God coming. Well, I do feel. I, sometimes okay. I feel it come through. But so the yeah. problem is, for the majority of us, is when we read something, we are reading it through our emotional filter. Does that make sense to everyone? So let's say I say the word, I say something to you like, um, you lied today. Now, probably the majority of us did lie today, to be frank, mm. because the majority of us probably had a feeling or emotion today that we never spoke about with anybody. And when they asked us, are you okay? You said, I'm fine. When you weren't fine, you were feeling this emotion, right? So many of us probably did lie today. Now, if I make a statement, you lied today to an audience, that statement goes out there, right? You lied today. And then it, so it's coming towards me. I lied today. Now, if I have an emotion about being falsely accused in me, I'll go, I didn't lie today. What's he saying? What's he going, what's he going on about now? You know? And I start getting really, really defensive and everything, right? And, and in reality, I might have lied today by the definition of the person who's 
telling me this particular thing, but I'm not now listening to his definition of what that was because I'm now having this emotion inside of me of like, I'm reacting. Yeah, right? And this is how all of us interact generally. All of us interact to everything via these filters. This filter is coming towards us. This, this, um, this stuff is coming towards us and we filter it through our emotional condition. And that emotional condition is very, very specific. So my filter might be, if it's a man who's 45 years of age saying that to me, it's not okay. <coughs> but if it's a, a, a man who's 22 years of age saying it to me, it's fine. <laughs> right? It could be that, you know. For example, let's say I'm a 22-year-old girl and the man who's 22 comes up to me, who's a good-looking man, 22, and he comes up to me and says, oh, you want to come out for a dance, right? She might go, yeah, that's fine. Right? But now the 45-year-old man comes out and says exactly the thing, same thing. Do you want to come out for a dance? Oh, what a sleaze bag he is. Like, what, what, is he to get, you know, what is he trying to do? Connect me? You know, he should go and find someone his own age. You know, like, can you see how just it's very specific, my emotional response, based on what's coming at me. Can you see that? Yes, yes. And that's where we see everything, through these filters that we have. These filters that we have define everything coming at me. So a person can actually make a statement that's just a statement of truth and because of my emotional condition I turn it into this song and dance and great big you know drama and everything else and yet the person was actually just stating the straight truth to me without any judgment. Right? Now the problem is is it's usually our own judgment that causes us to switch out emotionally. Can you see that? It, like it, if I have a judgment about being called a liar, then I'm going to react totally different emotionally than if I can just say, ah, well, when I look at it today, yeah, I probably did lie about some things, you know. Um, it would be a totally different response inside of me. Can you see that? Yeah. Okay. So everything I read is like this. Every single word in every single inflection is read through my emotional filter. And this is why communication on earth is very tricky. Because on earth, everyone's in different conditions emotionally, with all these different injuries emotionally, and some are in good space emotionally, some are not so good space emotionally, some like women, some don't like women, some like men, some don't like men, some like children, some don't like children, and so forth. There's all these different conditions emotionally that are going on. And the words are coming at me, and they might mean one thing, but I'm interpreting to mean something completely different through my emotional filters. So, how do I determine truth? The only way to determine truth, really, in the end, is work on my emotional filters. How do I do that? Every single thing that comes to me, if I have an emotional reaction, right, and not an, I'm not talking intellectually here, there's an emotional feeling in me, of any type of feeling in me, that this emotional reaction, that this words create, I own it as my own. And if it's disharmonious with love, so let's say it's anger or shame or sadness <coughs> or any of those things, I feel it until completion. And when I'm in that state, after I've felt that, I will be able to listen to those same words and they will have a totally different effect on me. Right? And it's exactly the same when you read the Bible or anything else. Exactly the same as that. So when you read the Bible and you read something you just don't agree with, I, you know, allow yourself to get emotional about it. Right? Feel the emotions rise up in you. Feel the feelings in you and release them. Then you read another thing and that sounded really nice to you. Feel that as well. Allow yourself to feel about it. And then do one additional thing. And that is ask yourself, does God, would God feel the way I feel about this? You actually ask that question quite a lot on a lot of things. Okay. So if you ask that one question, would God feel the way I feel about this? Or would God react the way I'm reacting about this? And if the answer would be, oh, I don't think God would, then I'm, I know I'm automatically out of harmony with God. Now, a lot of people say, well, I don't know what God would feel. But that's not true, to be frank. You do. You do know. Like, do you think God gets angry about everything that's happened on earth? Because what happens when you get angry? 
you have a big spit, don't you, generally? Like, and then a lot of times you might throw a few things around and, you know, you, you know, when you get really angry, you might really go for it, mightn't you? And imagine if you were in a rage. Screaming your head off. Right, if you scream. Now, don't you think we'd be hearing it if God was in a rage? Like, <laughs> and, and don't you think of quite a few things would be broken if God was in a rage? Right? So obviously God's not in a rage. So obviously when I'm in a rage, I'm out of harmony with God. Does that make sense? I'm out of harmony with divine love. So I need to look at the fact I'm in a rage. What do I, what do, I do about it? My rage is my rage and I need to see what's under it whatever that thing is. And underneath that will be sadness, there will be firstly some fear probably, and then we go underneath that and there will be some sadness, and once we connect the sadness and release the sadness, we actually won't get in a rage about exactly the same thing that triggered our rage before. And we became, in that process, more like God. And the beauty of asking yourself that additional question and still feeling your own emotions is that you will actually eventually get to be at one with God by just doing that. And that's really all I do. And that's really all I've ever done. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yep. But it's not a process of fooling myself intellectually that I'm in that state. So you've got to be really, really honest with yourself. Like, you know, there's a lot of this stuff where we, we feel a bit of agitation, so we do the Zen thing, you know, we go into <laughs> meditation. Ah, <sighs> <sighs> oh, yeah. Oh, isn't that pleasant and wonderful? <laughs> I'm just so relaxed now. I'm just so tuned out. No, that thing didn't bother me at all. But why did I have to just do this? Right? Because it did bother me, right? And I'm not honest with myself. So I need to allow myself to be honest with myself with that initial reaction and understand there's an emotion in there that I can now focus on and get to with that reaction if I allow myself to. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Uh, Joe, I just wanted to ask about... Um, is the mic on? Yeah. About your combined soul condition, the, the, the soul. Yeah. And, and just as it says that um, God is not partial. But what I'm trying Before to... Before you ask that question, can you hold on to that question for me? Because I think Dave's question is going to be more in line with our previous discussion. Yes. Is that correct? So can we just do that? Sorry about that, Meredith. We'll come back to your question. So um, asking that question... Yeah, would God feel the way I feel about this? If we could develop that into a bit of a habit whenever we come across somebody or a situation, that would be a good habit and an easy way to start recognising and processing our emotions? Yes, you could say it's probably one of the tools you could use your mind for, um, is just to ask yourself that question. Would I'm feeling, I'm feeling controlled. Does God ever feel controlled? No. So I'm out of harmony with God when I feel controlled. It doesn't matter whether someone tried to control me or not. If I'm feeling controlled, I'm out of harmony with God because God doesn't feel controlled by this situation. And if I was in at one with God, I wouldn't even feel controlled with this situation. So therefore, I'm out of harmony. There's an emotion in me, not, not the other person trying to control me. That's their business. There's an emotion in me that I need to work through that's out of harmony. Does that make sense? Just in that one example. Yeah. Any more su questions about that subject, about the emotions and God? Like, no? Okay. So if we can go. Um, I don't know how to formulate it, but the question, it's like you were specifically chosen um, at the soul level even, or, and, and possibly you have answered it partially through there, that it was your soul condition that you were made, the qualities that you had. So were you specifically chosen um, to have those, um, not have to feel the emotions, which you didn't in the first century, because you didn't have that. It was taken from you. I Your did, damage was I taken. I did feel the emotions. So I don't feel that I don't, didn't feel the emotions, because but, I did. But you didn't have that soul damage. It was sort of withdrawn from you. I, the way I felt my emotions in the first century was that I felt them and experienced them in full at any moment. So I still had emotions to feel. Yeah. There were times when I was 15, for example, that I was tortured, and again when I was 21, and so forth, and I, and I had to feel lots of emotions, lots of pain, lots of physical pain. All these different things were feelings that I had, but I didn't store them. So there was this sort of attribute that began, and I still, myself in my current state, don't really understand how it began, 
that, that I could feel my emotions without actually feeling judgment of them, even though my parents had judgment of them. And so the feeling I have is that somehow I was cleared of yep, that judgment, if you like, of those emotions, and I was allowed to just feel my emotions. I don't understand how that occurred. I just feel that was a part of what happened in the first century. So was it necessary then for mankind to have that to come through, to, to show the error in our way? Yes, certainly. Yeah. And, and if it wasn't my desire to do it, there yep. would be some other soul that would have been born at some other time in the future. And when I say so my desire, I'm talking about my collective. Yeah, Mary is absolutely. my soul. Yep. So I'm talking about our collective desire for truth. Yep. So, so Mary has uh, this same soul attribute as yep. I have because we are one soul, not two separate <coughs> souls. Yep. We are one being expressed in two forms. <coughs> yep. And so she has exactly the same attribute. But in her case in the first century, this particular part aspect, which was being able to feel the emotions in their entirety, she couldn't, she didn't have for some reason. And I, and I did have for some reason. Now, I don't understand the reason why. I believe it has something to do with the fact that I was a male and that, that God knew that if, if it was a female in that state doing it, that she would have probably had less of an effect in, in the first century. Than, than I could have had as a male in the first century because of the big emotional mm. blockages men had towards women and often still do, right? <laughs> but, but far less now than they had in the first century. So, so what God did to me, I'm unsure of because yeah. obviously I didn't have a conscious awareness at the time of my birth very much because yes, of absolutely. my age. Does that make sense in my intellectual yeah. development and so forth? But I do know that there was something different about me and I knew that at a fairly early age of my own consciousness because I could I seemed to be able to feel my emotions completely when other people always seemed to block their emotions even my own parents seemed to block so it was God's love the gift of what he had done so that we would have yeah not through the blood sacrifices and all that yes but we get redemption by the knowledge of how to go about this that's right and and my my it was my soul's desire collectively yes. Mary and myself, mm -hmm. my, our soul's desire, that caused that longing to be there. So, and, and this is why I say it's the same with yourself with all sorts of your own desires, mm -hmm. is that every one of you have unique desires of your own and unique personality traits of your own. And when you recognize them in their complete form, you will change the world in some way, yeah. in a unique way that nobody else before you or, or after you will do. Yeah. Right? And, and every one of us is like that. It's just that the majority of us on earth never realize those desires. And it's only when we hit the spirit world or progress in the spirit world that we start recognizing them and start changing areas in the spirit world. Um, but the majority of us, because of our injuries on earth, never get through to the process of actually doing it on earth. And what you will most of it be doing in the future is doing it on earth, which will be an amazing experience, not only for yourselves, but for everyone around you to experience too. Yeah. If we can. This is a related question. Yeah. Is it on? Yeah, just right up. I think this is a related question. Um, I think I have a memory of being, like you say, where, the, where the, the new souls are outside the earth, like floating around the earth, and I had. Um, hmm. a wish to come in to the, the father that I had the parent that I had to help him find peace and happiness and to heal now would I have been in my joint soul or just my feminine part of my soul <coughs> and is that a truth anyway or am I just imagining it um, what's happening is you have a spirit with you who um, has a strong belief in the so the incarnating soul making choices, right? And this spirit um, is finding it very very difficult to 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 give up that concept because it's been taught that concept itself for all of its life, and even its life in the spirit world, it's been taught that concept too. It's been taught by higher spirits who are on the natural love path in the sixth sphere, who have this strong belief that. Um, that you that the soul of a child chooses its parent if you like due to triggering the parent the truth is uh, sort of a little modified from that 
in that the parents uh, longings and soul condition produce a law of attraction with a personality of a soul that's going to trigger them to the most possible effect right this is why for the majority of us when we have children we feel like we're absolutely triggered in every possible way right and and this child is actually for the parents growth as well as for the child's growth this whole incarnation process now the truth is the child does not know of that choice at that moment the instant inca it incarnates, it can gain an awareness of that choice by the spirit guides who are with it. Does that make sense? So the spirit guides who are with that child who has just incarnated can give that child a concept of this in order to help the child understand what's happening to it. And there are many spirits in the spirit world who spend a lot of their time trying to give children that are just born or even unborn at the soul level these concepts so that the children don't react as violently emotionally to the process as they would without knowing the concept do you follow me and um, in doing that though a lot of times there's a distortion of truth in the child in that they feel they must have had a pre-conscious existence a pre-incarnation conscious existence which is not the case they they had a un, an unconscious pre-existence before they incarnated and when they incarnate they gain consciousness of self but at that moment in time any person around you now can influence you including guides or spirits who can actually give you concepts to assist you with your life and this is why many people have these kind of concepts already in their mind uh, and and the truth is the way to deal with it is deal go through all of it emotionally and at the end you'll understand how you got that concept does that make sense? So you don't have to give away the concept right now. All you need to do is understand emotionally how that concept entered you at some point in the future. And if you progress on the divine path, you will in the end understand how every single concept you have ever had has entered you. you even the ones that are in error, you'll understand how it entered you and why you believed it to be true. The key is just to process it all emotionally because that's how you eventually find out the truth. If you do it intellectually, it's very, very hard for you to determine how it happened. Does that make sense? Yeah. So spirits, right from the moment you incarnate, can actually impress feelings upon your soul, which you then can assimilate as truth, even if that spirit is actually impressing upon you in error. So this is a, this is the and you will at some point in the future if it is an error you will find it leave your soul every truth that is a permanent truth will stay with your soul forever every error that you think is true will eventually be confronted and released from you that's the way God created her universe the universe is created in such a way that every single error inside of you as a being will eventually be released and every single truth inside of you as a being will eventually be solidified. So you don't have to worry too much about a lot of these intellectual concepts. Does that make sense? All you need to do is focus firstly on your relationship with God and then secondly on your relationship with yourself and, and, and receiving divine love and every other thing will come to you. Every other truth will also come to you in that process. Could I just address um, an emotion within that uh, concept that you have and that's about your relationship with your father? If you can focus a little emotionally on um, what that expectation or the feeling that you're there to make your father happy in your life, what impact emotionally that's had on you, um, there'll be a lot in that for you, yeah. I've already gone through a lot of that but yeah, there must be more. Yeah. 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 So does everyone understand what Mary is just saying there? Like that that concept actually was born from an emotion that you must please your father, and that you're there to actually help your father, and that's not actually a truth. God didn't create you to help your father. Does that make sense? Yeah. God wants us to follow our passions and desires. 
and in that process we end up helping a lot of people just through our, you know, the honouring of ourself. Um, but we were never created just for another, you know, to serve another person. Well, thank you. That brings up another question in me. Um, my sister has come over to visit me from Adelaide and just happens to be here this week. <laughs> Um, and we've been bringing, watching the DVDs, we've been bringing up a lot of stuff and remembering things from our childhood. And the memory has come up of um, us going for a swim at the end of a jetty when we were children. I forget what age. We were children and we both decided, she tells me today that it was my instigation <laughs> and she didn't really want to. Yeah, it's always but, yours. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But she did it for me. Yeah. Um, so we got down into the water off the end of the jetty and we were going to swim to the shore and I headed off and I heard her behind me saying I can't do it, I can't do it, help, help and I said I have to, I have to go, you'll have to save yourself, you'll, I have to go yeah. and so yeah, is that following my own truth or is that being mean, <laughs> you know, is that being selfish yeah. um, and, and then I swam that whole thing and when I got only when I got to the beach did I panic about her and run down the whole length of the jetty and say, where is she? How is she? But I, I left her. I left her for dead. Is yeah. that following my passion? Uh, when you follow your passion, it's always harmonious with love. So what was driving your response in this particular case was fear. There was some personal fear about your own safety that drove the decision. I knew I couldn't save her. You knew you couldn't help her and also help yourself. Does yeah. that make sense? Yes. So there was some personal fear that drove the decision inside of you. The key is to connect with that fear and, and, and connect with what's underneath it. The fact that it came up today means that there must be some unhealed emotion mm. still there about that fear that you have. And also for your sister, some unhealed mm. emotion about being left behind. You know mm. what I mean? And, mm. and, and, and sort of neglected, if you like. But, but if you can focus on connecting with the fear that you had, it was a fear of, of, of death in the end, which, which obviously comes from our parents most of the time. Allow yourself to connect with that emotion. So rather than, rather than say to you, oh, that was loving or unloving, let's just remind ourselves one thing, and that is every time I act in fear, it wasn't loving. <coughs> So it wasn't loving of myself to save myself. No, it was because loving of yourself to always save yourself. But if you're acting in fear to save yourself, then you're <coughs> being unloving even to yourself. Yes. Does that make I sense? Can, I can relate that because two days ago I had a dream which brought this up. Yeah. In which she died at the beach again. <laughs> right. Okay. And I was there and <coughs> couldn't save her. So. Yes. And that's bringing up this fear that you have of death, of being responsible for someone else's death. Yeah. Right? And that's a fear that you de need to allow yourself to feel. There's another fear part of it too, and that's, you were going to mention it? Go on. Because there's a lot in it. There's also, there's also feelings that you have about yourself, of being a bad person, I must be a bad person. A failure. Uh, yeah, all of these things. So yeah. it's a beautiful trigger for you to yeah. access that stuff. just to add to my sister's statements, um, that has had a rippling effect throughout my life, yep. as well as I know we discovered today it was from the womb. So <laughs> um, perhaps you could help us there because we've been together in the last few weeks and so much has come forward. It's just incredible. We are working through a great deal. Yep. Um, and just a little bit of help from you guys would be really good. Um, do you see... Can you assist us with our pre-birth? Can you assist us while we're in the womb? Can you give us any indication as to, for me, this uh, ripple effect mm -hmm. has created a great deal of change in my life mm -hmm. in certain sections. Um, so we find this really is the cause of all of that. And you may be able to assist us to get over this. Yep. What, what we would like to do instead of doing what you want us to do <laughs> is... Is, no, 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 no. What we want to, if I can explain, what we want to do is we want to help each person to actually know how to do it themselves. So what we're not, what we're trying to get away from now is actually giving people individual advice about their own situation, and focus on the techniques that they're going to need to do to connect to their own situation. Does that make sense? 
The problem with giving you individual advice about your own situation is that there's six and a half billion people on the earth and to give six and a half billion people individual advice about their own situation is a very slow way that I would have to, if I chose that way, to change the world. It would be a very slow way. Does that make sense? And also, you are totally capable of working it all out yourself. So all we, what we're trying to do is give you the tools to work through these issues yourself. So maybe if I could make a few comments about that. You, your being together for two weeks is, is fantastic because it helps you work through together these unresolved emotions that have been a part of your life all through your life. And it brought them up. And it's brought them up. That's the key thing. And this is something that all of us need to become aware of. It's staying in interactions that causes us to be able to access causal emotion. If you had just had the first dream, got all stressed out about it, sent her home, <laughs> none of this would all be coming up, right? And so the beauty of all of these interactions is that they allow us to access causal emotion. So the first thing to remember with all of this is every single thing that happens to me is a beautiful way for me to actually access what's inside of myself. That's number one. The second thing is, every time I'm in fear, I am not in love, and therefore I am not going to access causal emotion, <coughs> and I'm not going to understand truth. So that's a very important principle to understand. But fears all need to be felt. Now at the moment you're working through a lot of your fears together, which is really good. Because you're working through some of these fears through your dreams and then telling your sister and then that triggers her and she's reminded of things that happened and how it's affected her life and then she feels upset about that and then she says, if that never happened then I wouldn't feel this and then there's all these emotions that come up. And the key is to allow that process to actually continue without judgment of each other. Mm. Does that make yeah, sense? So I went to bed last night saying, well, to myself, I don't want to make this an angry or a fighting or thing. Um, so yeah, I went to bed saying I would ask God for an answer and I woke up with a lot more information. So I, I took your advice from the DVD. That's it. And it helped me, but now I'm going to have to ask some more questions. I can see that. That's it. So thank you. <laughs> yeah. So the key is now, God knows everything that mm. happened to you mm -hmm. and the results of everything that happened to mm. you. God knows all of it. So if you can connect to God, and remember that's the whole point of us being here, is not for you to connect to us or rely on us at sure. all. It's to help you make this transition between self-reliance and connecting with God to get all of your answers. So if you can always remember God in all of your processing and in all of your questioning, you'll find if you have a sincere desire for any answer, every single answer will come to you. And it will come to you through the interaction. And the key is then having a sincere desire for answers. And that's sometimes the hardest thing. But when we have a sincere answers will come. Well, thank you. You have actually helped us already in that process. So yeah. We appreciate it. Yeah. And it's, it's designed beautifully by God as well through the law of attraction and through the law of desire. So if, if, um, if we suddenly hit you with all of the truth from all of your lives, it would probably be almost overwhelming and all too much and you might give up and go home and just never, you know, turn on the DVD player again. Um, so if you, if you have a sincere desire, if you activate that desire, you're aware of your law of attraction, you stay in the interactions, you involve God in the process, it will all happen in a beautiful way that is just um, perfect for your own growth. Can I confirm what you just said? I met two wonderful people in my sister's backyard collecting wood. They're the nicest meet people I've met in some time and it was just a pleasure and I thank God for it because it was an increased and improved law of attraction that happened yeah. because I believe I spoke and asked and received from God. That's it, some yeah. indication. So it was just beautiful. It was just like we had hugs. It was amazing. Yeah. So my law of attraction has gone up yeah. because of all of that. So awesome. Thank you. And law of attraction changing is a good thing. Yeah. Law of attraction changing means yeah. soul condition changing. Yeah. <laughs> And so that's a, that's a really good measure that things are changing for you. Um, the key is to, to be patient with yourself and patient with the process. A lot of times, because of a lack of love of self, we get very impatient with ourselves. We want things to happen yesterday. And, and often that impatience creates a lot of uh, negative events for us rather than actually uh, assisting us uh, to progress at, the, at our fastest possible speed. 
So allow yourself to feel your emotions. Just be. All you need to progress is really three things. A love of truth, God's truth, not your own. A love of God's truth. A desire for God's love. And humility, which is the desire to experience all of your emotions the moment they occur. Those three things is all you need. Every Simple but not easy. Yeah. <laughs> The last is, humility is, the, is one of the hardest things and it is also the thing that the majority will continue to fight with until we're at one with God. But, but it is the most important quality to actually develop within yourself. And if you do those three things, um, you will undoubtedly continue to change forever. Not just, and not, so remember this change in process is not just about releasing the emotional injuries because you'll get to the eighth sphere when you do that, if you connect with God. You'll get to the eighth sphere, you'll be at one with God. But remember there's, like, there's already another like 14 dimensions above that. <laughs> right? And surely you want to experience those too. And that's all about still having this huge desire for God's love, having a huge desire for God's truth, and remaining humble. It's exactly the same process. The desire to feel all of your own emotions. The beauty with those three things is that you will progress infinitely just doing them. And your progression is guaranteed if you do them. Yeah. And, and that's the beauty of the simplicity of the divine love path. Yeah. But as Mary pointed out, it's not always that easy. <laughs> what if uh, we have a break now for a little while? Some of you needing to go to the toilet and so forth. Um, so what if we have a break for about half an hour? Is that all right? What is the time, by the way? Quarter past eight. Quarter past eight. Um, how long were you intending to go tonight? Um, well, I think we should finish at least before maybe around half past nine to ten o'clock, around that time. So if we maybe have a short break now, 20 minutes or something like that, and then we come back and then we can come. Um, before we get started on the second little session, I'd just like to thank Michael and Suzanne for, uh, for organising all of this. and making their home available like they have. Like basically when a person makes their home available like this, it, like for them you're a strangers almost, don't you? So, and, and uh, although I, I would say that you've probably all met in a sleep state at some point, but um, from the awake state perspective, uh, you feel like strangers a bit. And it's lovely that they can do that uh, for us. It was really good. Um, all right, let's uh, get back to your questions. Far away. Where's the microphone? Uh, just there, right next to you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, AJ, are you... Um, are you it needs to be right up, I think. Yeah. Is, it, is it right up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, AJ, are you conscious of uh, visiting people in their dream state? Like You said that you probably would be on some of the earlier DVDs. Um, yes, sometimes um, we wake up knowing what we've done <laughs> and uh, have an awareness of that. And a lot of times the way the awareness comes is that people come up to us and say, oh, last night we, I was with you and we did this and away they went and, and yeah, I, I feel like I was there certainly. My issue that I'm still having myself emotionally is that I, I have a lot of unworthy emotions that I'm still working through myself. And that causes me to not want to know all the things that I'm doing in the sleep state. And as a result of that, uh, I have a tendency to try to... I don't dream at all as a result of that, and I don't have any recollection generally of my sleep state experiences. I have occasional recollection. So instead of having... In the end, what will happen is every one of you will have an, a complete recollection of all your nightly experience. From the moment you sleep, go to sleep to the moment you wake up. All right? And you'll remember all of those events. In fact, when you pass into the spirit world, one of the first types of transitions you go through is an amalgamation of your sleep and awake state experiences. And uh, this process is defined and, and demonstrated by some books that you can actually read. The Robert James Lee's books, uh, particularly the Through the Mist book, demonstrates how this amalgamation process takes place. So he spent a little bit of time in the spirit world 
uh, not realizing that he, when he was asleep he was in the spirit world and then there was a trigger which was the uh, meeting of his own mother in the spirit world that caused him to have a whole set of memories about the fact that he had been with her every single night in his sleep state all the time that he was on earth and he, she died at his birth so, so he, he, he was in, his, in the pre that state he was actually thinking he was going to meet a new person that he'd never, never met before and he'd wonder, he was wondering what he would feel and he was wondering you know, how they'd get on and all this kind of stuff and then as soon as he met her, he realized, oh, I've been, I've been seeing her every night, you know, like, <laughs> and had been ever since he'd been born. Who was the author? Pastor? Uh, Robert James Lees. You can download those books now on the website, uh, divinetruth.com. It's under the section, the one I'm referring to is under the section, uh, Downloads Divine Love Path. And uh, there's a... Um, the book I'm referring to is called Through the Mists by Robert James Lees. Yep. It's a PDF document that you can download. Yep. And, and there are, what happens when you pass into the spirit world is not immediately, but generally after a short period of time in the spirit world, um, at, well, when I say short period of time, it's not always true either. It depends upon your own um, emotional and intellectual condition as to what happens to you when you when you pass but for the majority of people after a short period of time in the sleep in in these after they've passed they start realizing that when they're asleep they spent all of their time in the spirit world and they have remember they remember those events and those events include <coughs> teeing up meetings like this like many of you heard about the divine love path in your sleep state before you heard about it in your awake state. And this is why some of you felt like impelled to go and get a DVD, for example, <coughs> even when you thought, oh, this, oh this, I've got no idea why I'm doing this, but I feel like I'm impelled to go and do it. And the reason why is because that's probably something you came up against in your sleep state already, and, that's, and usually what happens in your awake state experiences is you, is you tee up things in your sleep state, which you then plan for yourself to experience in the awake state. And so often, your next day's experience, a lot of the experiences that are unplanned are actually your planned experiences from your sleep state. Um, and so that happens all the time. And so many of you learnt about, you know, even things like these kind of meetings happening on Earth only by learning about them first in the sleep state. And then you arranged things in such a way to maybe go along to you know, one of Peter's seminars, if it was that that drew, drew you, or connecting with a friend who knew about it, or, you know, and those kind of things, which causes you to then, in your awake state, do a heap of things which leads you to the truth. Yeah. And when you pass into the spirit world, you will remember that you did that. Or, when you become at one with God, you will remember all of those experiences. So, if you become at one with God on earth, Obviously, you've then released all of your emotional blockages, so you'll actually remember all of your sleep state experiences. Does that make sense? Well, I have something related. Um, when I was young, I did some astral travelling. Yep. Um, it was just something that we went through at that time. Um, and I was told that was very wrong to do that. So is that perhaps why I don't remember my dreams now? Because it frightened me and what I heard, everyone said it was bad for me all that sort of stuff. Mm. Is it related? Yeah, very much related. Yeah. What you were told, it's not so much... Uh, something else too, I woke up once and it was with a big shudder and I felt like someone was shaking the bed. Yeah. Um, so I, does that mean I came back in my body quickly? That's what I've heard. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, so yeah, it kind of freaked me out. It was really, really strange. I didn't yeah. know I was astral travelling. I just came back in the bed, was shaking and I was yeah. screaming. Yeah. Um, so m perhaps I was and... The whole thing became a fear thing, so now I don't really remember many <coughs> dreams at all. And that's Unless the issue. Unless it's on waking or something. And that's the issue. Emotionally, the whole thing became a fear thing. Yeah. And as soon as that happens, you start turning off things that we could easily do. Yeah. Um, the issue too is that you were told by someone else that it's a bad thing, which is a lot of judgment, which mm. prevents the child. If it was a bad thing, then you wouldn't have done it. Mm. The, the truth is that God has opened up these abilities we all have 
the ability to communicate with spirits, the, community, the ability to leave our body at any time we wish and spend time in the spirit world. And these abilities can be developed. But if you focus on developing first your relationship with God, yeah. all these other things will come to you anyway. Right. And all the emotional blockages as to why you don't do them now will all be sorted out as well. You'll just automatically clear it all for me and that'll be it. That's no right. No worries. And then you'll be able to do your astral travelling whenever you want. Well, that would be divine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And like ones who are farmers can go and check the fence while they're laying in bed, you know, like, instead of having to go out there on the, on that's the bike. That's true. You know, I and visited a girlfriend of mine and I, I said, go to bed early, I'm going to come visit you tonight. This was the very first planned thing. And I went through the window into her room and her bed was empty, but her sister's bed um, there was someone there and I thought, she's gone watching TV. Um, I went to school the next day and mentioned that. She said, no, I just slept in my sister's bed last night. <laughs> oh, okay. So there you go. I could not have known that. Exactly. Yeah, so, so you were actually there. Yeah. Yeah. Very yeah. It's amazing. And this is a part of our soul. We all have the ability to do this. Of course, there are a lot of times we do it and we find out things that are quite traumatic. So like if you're in a partnership with a partner who's cheating on you, you may visit them and realize they're cheating on you with another person and then you know not want to remember that in your awake state for example so there's a lot of things that we actually see in our sleep state too that we don't want to remember in our wake state and once we work through all of that emotionally we will remember those things and this is why it's so important to actually let yourself feel your emotions completely because it's the feeling of your emotions completely that opens everything else up for you. Yeah. I was going to ask about lucid dreaming. Um, is that a way that we can remember our dreams and even control them, which some people have done, to choose what they're going to dream and be fully aware that they're dreaming? Okay. Lucid dreaming is generally a, a complete sleep state experience. So it's actually an experience generally that you actually have in the spirit world. So when you plan a lucid dream, you're actually planning your sleep state experience you're in the spirit world. And certainly you can do that at any time. So that's different to a dream. When you dream, usually the purpose of your dreams is to trigger an emotion within yourself. But then you have sleep state experiences. So when you wake up, you're remembering one of two things. And lucid dreaming is actually when you've planned to have an experience in the spirit world in your sleep state, and you remember. Yeah. I, I remember um, one time waking up. I was wondering about processing emotions too in the sleep state or mm. whatever, and. I was crying. I was just, and and my husband said, "You're crying. What's wrong?" And I thought, "Oh, what? What? Yeah. Uh, um, nothing." Yeah, uh, yeah. So, is that possible to do that work also in that? Because we do that, yes, and we do go possible. into the spiritual world, and it also is essential um, because there are certain sleep state experiences you've had that have actually triggered causal emotion in you, and the only way to deal with those emotionally is to deal with them in your sleep state. Is that to to avoid some of the pain? Or no, no, or it's because they were created in your sleep state. So you, were, you have many experiences in your early childhood, for example, where, where you're damaged in your sleep state emotionally, and y the way to release them is in your sleep state as well. If you've received the damage emotionally in your awake state, then you need to release them in your awake state. So while I was sleeping and off in the spiritual realm, there was some soul damage Yep. That happened then. Yeah, and for many it's like they see an ugly spirit and it scares them and so there's some fear. Or when, they're pe when they were asleep and their parents were asleep, their parents treated them just as badly when they were asleep as when they did when they were awake. Does that make sense? And so there's sleep state emotions to deal with. All of you are already dealing with your sleep state emotions. Right? It's just that you're not aware of it but you're not consciously dealing with many of your awake state emotions, which is the area that's going to help you the most now because you're already doing the work in your sleep state, but you also need to do your work in your wake state. Does that, does that mean nightmares as well? Nightmares are a little bit different, as Mary pointed out. Nightmare is when you're not dealing with something in your awake state, and the nightmare is a dream purposefully constructed by yourself and your spirit guides and others around you to help you deal with that emotion in your awake state. 
So, so those are, these are purposeful constructions in your sleep state to help you deal with your awake state emotions that you're in denial of. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. you want to go? You want to speak? Uh, if we go out the back, uh, thanks. There's a mic coming up. <coughs> Just a, an observation about dream. I, I did Peter's Alpha course. Yep. And the Monday night we went into the tripping around the universe. I don't know whether he's t you know yep. about it. Yep. Anyway, that night when I went home, I sort of went to sleep and I woke up and I felt as if I was being something was being drawn out of me. It was a really weird sensation. I just can't describe it. It was just sort of as if I was being sort of sucked out and it scared me so much and I just couldn't go back to sleep for ages. I, right. I don't know what that was. <laughs> well, the key is again to go into the emotion of it. So when something freaks you out, the first thing that we're tempted to do is to try and get away from the experience of fear. Now, fear is one of the most, and terror, are one of the most difficult sets of emotions to deal with in your awake state. Because to deal with them, you've got to be in a terrified or fearful state. And then what happens is you need to also breathe diaphragmatically and allow this terrified or fear-based state to overwhelm you emotionally. The problem with fear for most of us is we do not allow it to overwhelm us emotionally and so it locks it down. It, it locks it up inside of us. When it's locked up inside of us, it actually prevents all other emotions from flowing as well. So when you have a fear-based sort of experience like that with an interaction in the spirit world, uh, when you wake up, always go into the emotion that it triggers. And when you go into the emotion that triggers, it, even if it means staying in that state for two hours, shivering or shaking or whatever, that is a far better thing for you to do. Pray to God during that process to just keep you in that process and to breathe diaphragmatically, which means breathing sort of into the tummy region. If you allow that to occur, you'll be releasing the fear in your awake state that that particular experience has triggered. And that is going to be an essential part for many of you in dealing with many of your fears. Does that make sense? Mm. Now, I've been through that process a lot, a lot of times. I spent nearly three months in that state. Um, of, of having these fear-based experiences and Mary's had the experience of doing the same thing but you need to experience your fear you cannot intellectualize your fear if you really want to release it to release it it's the same as releasing any other emotion and that is to actually experience it but if you say communication with God God's going to help you stay in that state for as long as possible so you can experience that fear and release it and you may need to revisit these fears a number of different times. Some of you have had quite traumatic childhoods, right? Some people have been abused as a child. There's a lot of fear in there when that's occurred. And what we need to do is allow ourselves to experience this fear in a bodily way and understand that God's got our hand while we're holding our hand while we're dealing with that emotion. So if we can do that, we'll get through those fears. And once we get through the fears, it's just about every other emotion is a lot easier than dealing with our fear. Yeah. Well, I just want to make sure no one wants to continue with what you're talking about first. Mm -hmm. There's a gentleman back here, I'm not sure. Who wants to raise about it? Yep, okay. It's actually a little bit of a different subject. If I... That's all right, yeah, that's yeah. fine. Um, it's to do with the law of attraction, and I've done Peter's Alpha course in Tamworth. Yep. That's how I guess how I got involved with all of this. Yep. Is, um, if it can help me with the situation, it's not from sort of personally, it's from my son, who's nearly nine, who's, um, I guess, fairly severely autistic. Yep. And, you know, we, my wife and I, have got two lovely daughters, and, you know, generally the family's a pretty happy sort of situation, but I guess my fear with the, the family is that, you know, he's he's not really, uh, he doesn't communicate much, like, not, not verbally, so it's very difficult, and it's very... So your son is your only autistic child? Yes. No, your daughters aren't autistic, yes. they are fine. fine. Okay. Um, if I can let you know what's happening in terms of its creation and then also how you can help it, yeah. that'd be right. Um, in terms of autism and Asperger's type syndromes, um, if I can illustrate what actually happens at the soul level, when, when certain children are born who are very, very sensitive, they actually get a bombardment of all of our own personal unhealed emotions. Now, if they're so sensitive to those emotions, 
what happens is that they do not allow, they, they do not feel a separation between their own emotions and somebody else's emotions. So for the majority of us here, we're feeling a separation between our own emotions and our next door neighbor's emotions. For a, for a child who's, who, who's autistic, they're not feeling any separation between their own emotion and somebody else's emotion being bombarded at them through the, the denial of the emotion passing through the other person. So what that means is, as parents, that everything passing through me doesn't get felt by my children. Everything that I deny passing through me emotionally automatically gets transmitted to my children. And for a, a child who is autistic, they can't tell the difference between that emotion and their own emotion. So they have no sense of self, if you like. Now, it, the reason why it happens with some children and not other children, and usually you'll find many times it happens with one particular gender, is because many of those denied emotions apply to that particular gender. So in your case with your wife and yourself, there are unhealed emotions within yourselves that, that are more to do with women than to do with, uh, sorry, more to do with men than to do with women. And so there's more denial of those emotions occurring for both of you. And what that's done is that's then created, you've got a very sensitive child who's very sensitive to emotion. And what's happened is that he's receiving, so he is receiving a bombardment of those emotions. Um, did I say to women or men? You said it right. I said it right, yeah. He's receiving a bombardment of those emotions and, and he can't separate those emotions from himself. He can't tell the difference. So of course the only way to solve the issue now is for both parents to work through their unhealed emotions regarding that gender. In, the in this case, regarding the male gender so mum will have some emotions regarding the male gender that she's denying the experience of. You'll have some emotions regarding the male gender you're denying the experience of. And the bombardment of that emotion, your son is a very sensitive soul, and the bombardment of that emotion is actually causing him to not be able to separate his own emotions or his own life from your lives. And the best way to help them, of course, is to feel all of your own emotions. Now, we have some friends who, who are in Tasmania who have an um, autistic daughter. Their emotions are towards women. So father and mother's emotions are towards women. And this girl is a very sensitive girl and she's receiving the bombardment of these emotions. Since they've tried dealing with their own emotions, she has changed remarkably in one year. So, so much so that the people who are involved around them who keep asking them, what are you doing to cause a change in your daughter? And they're saying, well, all we're doing is dealing with all our emotions. And they say, no, that's not it. <laughs> so, and the, the daughter's getting better and better and better. What they've also found is that they went, they've come recently up to Queensland for a holiday and spent time with parents on the way up. And every time they spent time with parents, their daughter got worse. Oh. So their unknown, unhealed emotions with their own parents um, actually reflected immediately on their daughter and how the daughter acted in that situation. And so when they're home by themselves now, the daughter reacts quite well with everything. And they're having moments now where they can see the daughter is experiencing her own emotions. When it gets fully healed, what will happen is there's like a threshold of emotional bombardment that uh, a child can handle. In the case of uh, an, an autistic child, that threshold is quite low. In a case of a, an average child, the threshold's quite high. So what that means is most, peop most people have a child that's not autistic because the child is not highly sensitive to the bombardment of emotions and the bombardment of emotions is, is about the same level to what the child can cope with. So therefore the child can have its own experience. Once what happens with an with a autistic child, once the bombardment of emotions gets lower than what the child can can um, not cope with, the child now starts having its own experience. So what will happen is you'll notice a slight improvement over a period of time as you deal with your own emotions and then all of a sudden, like within a very, very short period of time, your child will change quite, quite markedly. Does that make sense? Yeah. And that's, so you have a slow progression as you're working your way through blockages and emotions and then all of a sudden what will happen is bang and, and 
the child will start having its own emotional experience. Yeah, because yeah, I guess I just look at the life I've had with, like, within my own family as a child and my, and my wife's from what I know, and it's all been pretty good, pretty happy. Uh, both my parents are all still together. It's all gone pretty well. That's exactly what this couple was saying to me at the beginning of their process. <laughs> It's the suppression of emotion that's co occurred multi-generationally in both of your families uh, regarding women generally. Oh, sorry, men generally. And and because uh, in your case it's a, a boy child that's the autistic child. Does that make sense? So it's regarding men. So it's the emotions you have regarding the suppression of masculinity and it's regarding what your wife has in suppression in terms of her feelings towards men and towards herself with regard to men that creates the autism. But you'll notice the person, each child connects to a parent specifically generally. So, you know, sometimes I'll relate to my father in a certain way and strongly to my father and not very much to my mother. And then, and then a different child may relate more to its mother than to its father. So that also is, is a part of this. You'll notice that if one like what they've noticed in this family is that is that they've had to both work through their emotions about women but the father seems to have more of an effect on the child as he's changing in her, in their case she, it's his daughter sure. because there seems to be some kind of emotional affinity there towards his emotional suppression and what's going on in the daughter <coughs> so I'd suggest in your case that it's possibly the opposite yes it is mm. then relates much more to my wife exactly yeah. I guess even myself as a child, I did a lot more, like, related much more to my mother. Yep. Even like my father's. And if this is exactly what the both parents felt with regard to the opposite gender mm -hmm. in, in their case. And so my suggestion is to try it as an experiment, okay, and, and you'll see that what I'm saying in time you'll see is, is truthful. But, <coughs> but it's... Um, the justifications that you have inside yourself is that you both feel you've had it for a fairly good life. Yes. And this is exactly what uh, Zenko and Janine felt as well, that they both felt they had fairly good life. But now that they've started dealing with their emotions about it, they've noticed the big effect on their children. So this is not about you having a fairly good life. It's actually about the sensitivity of your child to the suppressed emotions within you. So it doesn't matter how bad your life was. It just means your child is very sensitive to the suppression of any emotion in you. And uh, it's actually quite a blessing to have a child like this. It's far better than having someone else in your ear because you will see big changes in your child when you do more, more than the average children change. Yeah, we found with our daughters, I'm in there and just approaching their teens and they're very, uh, they've got a lot of empathy towards people and yep. other children. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, that's some good that's come of this. They've, they've learned to, uh, they've, they've very much leadership. They don't like seeing people being picked on. And yep. They have very good strong qualities. Yeah, that's lovely. Yeah, and you'll find that as you work through the emotions inside of yourself, your, your son will actually finish up having some pretty good qualities that you, he can't recognise for himself at this point. Yeah, yeah. Far away. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, is it on? Yeah, good. Um, when I ask, or what I wanted to ask about is when we go pass over into the spheres, yep. uh, generally first, second or third or fourth sphere, whatever, um, and then we move on to the next sphere, whatever. Oh. As in, with you, you're reincarnated, so you actually remember a lot of your previous life. Mm -hmm. Do we remember the changeover from the previous sphere to the next sphere? Yep. We do? Yep. All right. I was curious about that. I, well, I wasn't sure if we had to, if we blanked that out and no. crossed over to the next one. No, you always remember. And, uh, and you'll make, many of you will make these transitions on earth anyway, not in the spirit world. So many of you will find yourself arriving in one of the higher spheres rather than the lower spheres once you work through these issues on the divine love path. So you won't have to you won't have the memory of the transition on it in the spirit world you'll have the memory of when that transition occurred on earth yeah well 
Fair enough, but we may end up, you know, going to the fourth sphere or fifth sphere, sphere, but then we've still got to go up, so we're still going to remember when we go in the spheres. So. Well, yeah, you are. Yeah. The key is to not worry about that too much. Oh, no, I was just curious. Yeah. I wasn't sure if we'd blank it out or if we... No, you don't blank it out. Your soul has got a complete record in it of everything that's ever happened to you. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Some people call that, by the way, the... What is it? The Akash uh, Records and so forth. Akash Records. Yeah. Um, those records are not really a record in terms of a universal record. What they are actually is that every one of your soul has a complete record of everything that's ever happened to you. So this is how like spirits who come to talk with me know who I am because they can see this complete record inside of me. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. and, and it's hard for you to see it because you're a person, so you, you know, living in a physical existence, so it's harder for you to determine that. But for spirits, like I, we had some spirits visit us recently who were spirits who were my disciples in the first century who got very angry with me and left. And they were living in the hills for all that time, for the last 2,000 years. Um, they got very angry with me because of me entering a relationship with Mary uh, in the first century. And, uh, and they came to talk with me about that 2,000 years later. Huh? It took them 2,000 two years to work through. They had so much anger and rage with me about the issue, and, and with Mary about the issue, that it took them 2,000 years to come to think. To the to the you know discuss it, but what I'm pointing out is they knew who I was and knew who Mary was because of the records within our own soul. Does that make sense? Yeah. Every one of you have a record from the moment you incarnated from then onwards in your own soul, and any other person can read it once you know how to read it. Many of you already have the ability within you to kind of go to somebody and say to them, "Oh, I think this might have happened to you," and be right. And the reason why you're doing that is that you're actually, you're actually learning in this place to read the record that's in their soul of what happened to them. Does that make sense to everyone? Now, when you get in a spirit world, you'll know how to do this more and more and more. And, and also, of course, when you do this on earth, as you get on the divine path and work your way through your emotions, you'll actually do this more and more as well yourself, like on earth. And so you'll be able to help people really well because you can actually know what happened to them when they were little and, and actually pinpoint the emotions and everything inside of them. Is that maybe what I've been going uh, You need the microphone. Sorry. Can't do it without a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> um, no free hearing. <laughs> no free hearing about the microphone. <laughs> Is that maybe what I was talking to you about before where I get that feeling of knowing where someone's, the feeling that I... Yes. I feel their feelings? Yeah, well that's a little different in that what you're doing there is you're feeling their current soul feelings, whatever those feelings are. What I'm talking about with this record is that you actually can feel the events and know what events occurred to create their current feelings. Oh, okay. Which is sort of an addition to that. Okay, thank yep. you. Can I... Uh, 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 sorry. Uh, I've, just got a, I've just got a question on... Um, on uh, behavioural boundaries, um, when you supposedly are expressing emotions, if it's a good expression of emotion, say for instance if it's sadness or whatever and, and you cry, that's one thing, but you see poor behaviour from some people who are expressing emotions that is in an inappropriate form. Um, how do you view that? Well firstly it's important for you to express all your emotions. But the proviso is this, if I express my emotions in an unloving way, there will be more soul damage on my soul than if I express the emotion in, its, in, its good, in, its, in, a, in a pure form. So let's say I'm angry. If I'm angry and I project that anger at another person, then I'm now being unloving in the way on which expressing that anger. And we see that uh, quite often in our current situation, you yeah. know, right throughout the world today. That's right. Yeah, spot on. And so, so the key is to say to yourself, all right, if I'm expressing my emotion in a way that I'm projecting it at another person, then I'm actually not experiencing my causal emotions. What I'm actually doing is attempting to damage another person and that will have its own law of compensation effect on me. I'm actually going to get into a worse condition than I currently am if I do that. 
if I'm expressing my emotions by owning them completely, so let's talk about anger. If I went outside and bashed the, um, yelled and screamed and bashed the, you know, the punching bag, now I'm expressing my same emotions, but I'm not projecting it at the person. I'm not trying to harm the person. I'm trying to connect inside of myself to what's going on inside of myself. Now I'm actually releasing damage and I'm not damaging myself further. So you are right, there are certainly appropriate ways in which we can deal with our negative emotion. Of course the appropriate way, and if I redefine humility again, it's the passionate desire to experience all of my own emotions. So when I have a passionate desire to experience all of my own emotions without projecting them on another person, I am being completely humble. And if you are always completely humble, you will never be harming yourself more or anyone else more in the expression of your emotion. Yeah, occasionally we see people expressing their emotions and they're harming other people around them, whether, you know, out of, uh, out of anger, out of rage, uh, out of grief, whatever they, you know, but that's exactly what they're doing. So, okay, that's a bit of a clarification on that. Yeah, so with regard to grief, for example, though, let's say I'm just crying in front of you. Well, I'm not harming you in any way, right? But if I'm crying in front of you expecting you to cheer me up, now I'm harming you. Because I'm actually expecting you to do something for me in the process. That, that would include emotional manipulation too, wouldn't totally. it? Totally. Well, all projection is actually emotional manipulation. Yeah. So just my, if I project anger at you, I'm now trying to manipulate you. Right? And, and the same with, as you say, crying or um, you, you see it, you see it in teenagers, you see it in young children. Yep. Um, manipulative behaviour to get what they want. Exactly. Um, and that side of it, uh, they're expressing an emotion, yes, and they are feeling their emotions, yes. Yep. But they're projecting it to get what they want. But they're not feeling their causal emotion are actually feeling an emotion of self-deception. Emotions of self-deception are all about trying to get other people to fix what I have going on inside of me. Yeah, or greed. Uh, greed. Well, greed. Even if it's grief, it might be an emotion of self-deception. Sorry? No, greed. Greed, greed yeah. Greed. Um, greed is a, or it could be a causal emotion or an emotion of self-deception. It depends what my, how I project it. Does that make sense? So if I want something from another person greedily, then I am now wanting the other person to fix my emotion. But if I can, I can feel my sense of greed inside of myself and not act upon it, now I'm feeling closer to my causal emotion. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does make sense. What you're saying is, um, you know, you, you feel your sense of greed and you're expressing it and you're dealing with it within yourself but you're not projecting it onto somebody else or trying to manipulate somebody else into doing something for you or to help you achieve your end cause. Exactly. Exactly. So it's very important to see the difference. Um, there are, so in the emotions of self-deception talk we had recently, we sort of outlined a, you know, a lot of these self-deceiving emotions. So there's a lot of emotions you can feel which are actually not your core emotion, but emotions that you're using to manipulate other people. And anger, rage, are two of those emotions. Like um, Many of you will feel the manipulation going on when somebody's doing it. Probably one of the, the probably one of the best examples of that is uh, somebody who is reacting in, in anger towards another person to get them to do what they want and a lot of times they will bow down to that out of fear. Spot um, on. Uh, yeah. Spot on. Yep. That's why most people use anger. Yeah, because they know they can use the anger to get what they want. So, you know, there are a lot of, like, very manipulative things happening just in, in anger itself. As soon as any one of you, or more myself, are angry, we need to own our anger because as soon as we project it at the other person, we are now trying to manipulate and control them into giving us what we expect from them. So, by the way, this even applies if the other person is treating us unlovingly and we get angry with them. If we get angry with them, we are now expecting them to be loving. Now, if you were, if you, if you were in harmony with free will, you wouldn't expect another person to be loving even. Does that make sense? 
because when you're in harmony with free will, you allow the other person to do whatever they wish, including be unloving if that's what they wish. All right. Well, given the example of um, being on the receiving end of, say, for instance, you're on the receiving end of somebody who is angry and uh, trying to angrily manipulate you, mm -hmm. and you realise what's going on, but you're in a situation where you can't stand up to it, so you have to sort of stand there and take it virtually. Um, in order to express your own emotions, which you know would be a bit of a mirage of emotions there, um, how do you actually tackle that? I mean, you, could, you, as I say, you feel probably quite a number of emotions from from fear to anger back to, you know, particularly probably want to spit on them at times. <laughs> but, um, you know, how do you express that? How do you deal with that and get rid of it? Well... If you if you go into anger immediately, you need to recognise that you're denying a deeper emotion. So if they're angry at you and you want to get angry back, you, you're playing their game. Then you you're getting angry to try and stop them being angry at you. What's probably under not underneath that is some fear, maybe some feelings of grief and hurt. So they would be the feelings you would be going to access. When you see a, a you know a classical clash in business, particularly of you know two businessmen or two powerful people in business, you'll see um, where one will start tearing strips off the other and the other one will either do one of two things, either stand up for themselves and it'll end up a, a quite a you know, heated uh, debate argument and can even end up into be a shouting match, um, or the other one will back down and just take it. Um, obviously feeling seething emotions underneath uh, and then they'll go outside and have a couple of smokes or you know, kick the lamppost or whatever. Yep. Um, or go home and kick the dog. Or yeah, go home, <laughs> kick the dog, kick the wife, you know, kick yep. the kids. <laughs> yep. um, in, in actual terms, how should they be starting to deal with those emotions if they are on the receiving end of that? You know, how do they start to process those emotions to get rid of them? Because we see a lot of that in the business world of pent up emotions, sure, and pent up anger and frustration. Sure. This this week uh, this weekend we're doing a talk in Brisbane called uh, How to, the Law God's Laws Governing the Love of Self, mm -hmm. and it sort of addresses most of those issues you've raised. the The truth is that when we love ourselves, we don't sit in a barrage of anger from another person, but we also, if we love ourselves don't get angry back with the other person. So what we would choose to do firstly is try to walk away, right? And when we walk away, it's not about sort of not owning our emotions. In other words, don't walk away because you're, see because you're seething, really. Walk aw if, if you're seething, you've got to walk away and go and punch a bag and let the seething emotions out, do you know what I mean? Handle those emotions in a loving way to yourself and to others. But understand that God doesn't get angry with people who are angry with God. So therefore, when I'm at one with God, I'm not going to get angry with people who are angry with me. Does that make sense? And so that means that I, if, I, if I am feeling emotion of anger within me based because they're angry with me, then I need to deal with certain emotions that I'm denying within myself. And I need to allow myself, you know, do something about that and deal with that but always deal with it in a loving way. Don't go and project those emotions back at the other person. Now, some people you can't get away from when they're angry with you. Like, some people will yell and scream and yell and scream and follow and yell and scream and follow and yell and they scream and follow. They've got you cornered. And, uh, and they just will not let you go. And now, obviously, this happened to me in my first century life, right, quite a lot, and particularly at my death where, you know, there were a lot of people angry with me and they weren't letting me go. Mm. And the truth is, under those circumstances, there's not much you can do but actually feel, you know, the barrage and stay connected with yourself emotionally. And that's really all you need to do in that situation. Now, when you're completely free of all of your own emotional injuries, you'll be able to stay in that situation and not feel a thing. You won't feel, in fact, all you'll feel is a loving emotion in return. Now, of course, that's when you're at one with God. Up until you, when you're at one with God, there will be other emotions in you that you will need to allow yourself to experience. And my suggestion is just let yourself cry. Most of the time, we don't want to let ourselves feel the deepest emotion because we feel that that's powerless and weak. 
in front of the other person, right? And in fact, quite recently, I, I'm getting accused a lot of being a coward because people are projecting large amounts of anger with me and I just turn around and walk away. And then while I'm walking away, they're yelling at me, see, you're a coward, you can't, you know what I mean? And it's all just there to trigger, to try and access their, my, you know, they're trying to still manipulate me and control me emotionally. And so I have to deal with that emotion within myself, like, you know, being treated as if I'm a coward when I know I'm not a coward sort of thing. And I'll need to allow myself to deal with that emotionally. When I allow myself to deal with everything emotionally, then I'm not projecting at the other person no matter what they do. And the beauty of doing that, and even like, you'll notice a lot with, uh, with crying, if you start crying in front of a person who's angry with you, there's a high likelihood the person will stop. Now, that's not always the case, right? But it is often the case. Not in business, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> not many people try it in business, to be frank. But, um, and, and I have had times when I've been crying and the other person's continued yelling and screaming at me. Mm -hmm. And then I've allowed myself to feel that emotion as well. Right? What that feels like, not being left alone, being controlled, not being left alone. Uh, it's not, sorry, not, not, yeah, not being, you know, allowed to feel my stuff in peace. Mm -hmm and allowed myself to work through that emotion as well, because these are all law of attraction events, don't forget. But your original question was one about what's the appropriate way to be angry. And the appropriate way to be angry is to feel your anger without projecting it at another person. Mm -hmm. The appropriate way to be sad is to feel your sadness without wanting another person to commiserate with you. Does that make sense to everyone? As soon as you want another person to commiserate with you, you are now not feeling your sadness. You are now manipulating them emotionally into cheering you up. <laughs> and also when you've, when you've got children who are using emotion to manipulate for their own causes or their own whatever they want, yeah. um, well, the, how's the best way to deal with that when you've got a, you know, a kid who's projecting their or expressing their own emotion to get what they want? There's a few things in that. If it's a very small child, they've learnt that somewhere. <laughs> and you probably need to look at a few of your own emotions and the way you deal with emotions, if that's in a manipulative way, because they're reflecting your emotions constantly as well. Also, it's, it's very loving to enable your children to access their causal emotion. And it's also loving to let them know when they're not accessing their causal emotion when they're being manipulative. So it is loving to point out, hey, you're trying to control me here and that's not going to work. Uh, there's another emotion you need to feel in this situation. Yeah, I recently have had the experience only over the weekend of, um, of, of uh, a close friend's child being extremely manipulative to get attention. And uh, yeah, I, I would have one suggestion for dealing with it and I noticed she dealt with it completely different other way. Yeah. Now, all of the things with children, though, to bear in mind, we, if you have a good listen to the parenting stuff that we've talked about, because um, our relationship with children is very different than our relationships with others, because our children are actually perfect reflectors of our own denied emotion. So when a child is trying to manipulate, if my own child is trying to manipulate me, it's because my child feels they can. And that means that I actually have an emotion inside of me that I feel I am easily manipulated or that I don't have a sense of self. And what I need to do is feel that emotion. See, when I intellectually try to stop the child from manipulating me, I am not feeling that emotion. And so the child is going to manipulate me again and will continue to do so until I feel that causal emotion. So the, in, the important thing for a parent is to always feel their causal emotion that the child is triggering. The child is only expressing your own denied emotion. So every time I deny emotion as a parent, my child will reflect back at me the emotion I'm denying. So in the case I just gave, I'm denying the emotion that I feel that I should do things for other people and I feel guilt when I don't, and my child then manipulates me to trigger that emotion. 
Does that make sense? Yeah, it does make sense. Yep. So, so when we own the emotion as a parent, our children will be very, very different in their actions toward us. So our relationship with our children is very different in a lot of ways than our relationship with other people. Other people's emotions are their emotions. While it is a law of attraction that it's happening with me, I need to work through my feelings and my emotions about it. With my children, they are reflecting directly to me my denied emotion right at the instant they're doing it. So right at the instant they're trying to manipulate me is the instant that I also at the same time have an emotion in me that I feel that I can be easily manipulated. Right at the same time. My children perfectly reflect at every moment my denied emotion. Yeah, that makes sense completely. Mm. So um, in the parenting uh, stuff that we've done and the question and answer of the parenting stuff that we've done, a lot of these questions are addressed about how to interact with your children in terms of working through emotions, which is a little different than interacting with uh, other adults in terms of our interaction. That would be the same with grandparents as well? Uh, you need to use the mic. Sorry. That would be the same with grandparents as well? Grandparents with their grandchildren? Yes. Yes. What happens with, uh, with our children and grandchildren and so forth, when the child is with me, whoever I am, the child is going to be reflecting my own emotions or reflecting the parents' emotions towards me. Does that make sense? So, in the case of a grandparent, the child could be reflecting my own denied emotion as the grandparent or right at that instant they could be reflecting the, their own mother or father's emotion towards me as well. So there's, a, there's an extra sort of facet in there with that. It depends on who they're identifying with at the time emotionally. Um, children are very powerful reflectors of emotion and very powerful reflectors of parents.